Hi everyone, welcome back. In this session, we are going to understand how do we actually measure financial assets at amortized cost. A quick recap: financial assets at amortized cost. I mean, financial assets will be classified at amortized cost when two tests are passed: when the CCFT test and when the BMT one test is actually passed. The CCFT test is trying to ensure that the financial asset, the benefit that we are going to get from the financial asset. comprises of solely payments of principal and interest the sppi test the future benefit should be in the form of contractual cash flows which are solely payments of principal and interest while the bmt1 test is trying to actually uh, understand what is the business model of purchasing that financial asset if the business model test 1 is satisfied it means that my objective is to hold the asset right up to its maturity this is the hold to collect model because i'm holding the financial asset so as to collect its contractual cash flows all right so when both these tests are satisfied we are going to measure the financial asset using amortized cost what i mentioned is it is not going to be fair value and just because an asset is going to be measured at amortized cost or where your business model is to hold it up to its maturity does that completely prohibit you from selling it at any point in time in future the answer is no if there are times of distress in extreme scenarios you may actually sell the asset as well all right so let's take a very quick example let us say you're purchasing a bond let's say you're purchasing an investment you're making an investment in reliance bond whose price let us say as at date is 1090 rupees all right the price as at date is 1090 rupees let us say the remaining duration of the bond the remaining tenor of the bond is actually 3 years remember i'm not trying to say that this is the total tenor you are going and purchasing a bond from the market the actual original tenor of the bond could be much more but this is the remaining duration all right this is the remaining duration of 3 years date of purchase let us say is 1st of april 2022 all right so i have purchased it on 1st april 2022 the coupon let us say is 8 percentage and the face value let's say is 1000 rupees All right. So obviously, if the uh, the purchase price is right now more than the face value because of different macroeconomic factors, the purchase price I've assumed it to be thousand ninety, while the face value is actually thousand rupees. All right. So this is the investment that you've made. Point number one is you will have to actually first decide if this is a financial asset itself. All right. Remember that we will apply this accounting standard only if the investment in bond is actually a financial asset. All right. so this investment in bond we'll have to first check if it's a financial asset now the second part of the definition of financial asset it basically talks about any contractual right to receive cash is going to be classified as a financial asset this investment in reliance bond is a contractual right to receive cash because you have a right to receive coupon and the right to receive principal at a future point in time all right so therefore investment in reliance bond is going to be classified as a financial asset once it is classified as a financial asset step number 2 or maybe let me just write it down so step 1 is whether it is a financial asset once you decide on if it is a financial asset the step number 2 is that you have to put it under one of the three categories amortized cost feoci or uh, fepl when do we put it under amortized cost we already just discussed all right let us say my business objective over here is to hold the asset right until its maturity so as to actually my business model is is nothing but to hold to collect all right and actually enter purchasing this investment in bond so as to actually collect its future cash flows and obviously this investment in bond satisfies the contractual cash flow characteristics test as well all right so now that both the tests are passed test and bmt1 test are actually cleared it means that asset will be recognized at amortized cost all right the financial asset will be recognized at amortized cost all right now we are going to see what does it mean when we are saying that the financial asset is going to be recognized at amortized cost initial recognition on day 1 day 1 recognition is also referred to as initial recognition on day 1 all financial assets not just financial assets at amortized cost all financial assets will be measured at its fair value all right all financial assets are going to be measured at fair value although we are talking about amortized cost right now all finance when i say all financial assets obviously it includes financial assets which are measured at amortized cost all right all financial assets will be measured at fair value 
the difference is if it is measured at amortized cost if you are incurring any transaction cost all right if you are incurring any transaction cost for example let us say you are paying any brokerage all right brokerage or commissions those will be treated as transaction cost and that will be added to the fair value all right so on day 1 i will be recognizing this investment in bond at its fair value plus any transaction cost now generally fair value is presumed to be equal to the amount of cash that you have paid all right the fair value is generally presumed to be equal to the amount of cash that you have paid unless you really are able to see that this transaction of 1090 is not at fair value all right unless there is evidence that this 1090 is not fair valued you would actually generally presume that this 1090 itself is actually fair valued and i'm assuming zero transaction cost for now all right so on day 1 you will be recognizing in your books of accounts investment in reliance at 1090 rupees all right you will be recognizing it at 1090 rupees all right now outside your books of accounts i'm just preparing a table having the series of cash flows all right on 1st april 2022 i actually paid out 1090 rupees all right on 1st april 2022 i have maybe let me just write it a little above on 1st april 2022 i paid out 1090 rupees on 31st of march 2023 sorry on 31st of march 2023 i am going to receive the coupon all right i am going to receive a coupon of 80 dollars all right on 31st of march 2024 i am going to receive further 80 rupees i think i said 80 dollars earlier i meant rupees on 31st of march 2025 which is the last year i said that the tenor of the bond is actually 3 years so in the last year i'm going to receive not just the coupon for that period i'm also going to receive the face value of 1000 so to totally making it 1080 rupees obviously the coupon is not applied on the purchase price the coupon is always applied on the face value and therefore we're getting 80 80 and 1080 all right if i actually calculate the irr all right in excel we have a function called as xirr all right where i have to just give the values and i have to give the corresponding dates what is xir are trying to do it's all it's trying to do is it's trying to calculate your return on a per annum basis all right you have invested 1090 today you are receiving 80 80 and 1080 what is your return on investment that is nothing but xir are all right the xir are in this case is turning out to be 4.71 percentage what the amortized cost approach is trying to say is your return is actually only 4.71 percentage the reason is you have actually paid 1090 although you are earning of a you are earning a coupon of 8 percentage you have a capital loss all right because you paid 1090 today and you are receiving only 1000 rupees at the end of the third year all right you are only receiving 1000 of principal at the end of third year so you have a capital loss which is actually eroding your return of 8 percentage all right although the bond is paying you a return of 8 percentage in the form of coupon what you have truly earned is actually 4.71 percentage so therefore this 4.71 percentage is called as effective interest rate all right it's called as effective interest rate often in the industry you will see that it's called as eir now if you actually look at the words effective interest rate we are trying to say that this is the effective interest rate you are actually earning all right the interest rate that you are earning is not 8 percentage if you amortize the capital loss over a period of 3 years all right if you amortize the capital loss over a period of 3 years on a per annum basis effectively you are earning only an interest income of 4.71 percentage okay what this 4.71 comprises of is it comprises of the 8 percent coupon that the company is paying and it is reduced by the amortization of capital loss over a period of 3 years and effectively you are earning an interest only of 4.71 what you will recognize in your books of accounts as interest income will not be based on the 8 percentage but will be based on this effective interest rate methodology all right in your books of accounts this 8% is not the rate at which you will recognize income although although you are receiving 80 rupees every year this is not going to be your interest income your interest income will be recognized at 4.71 percentage only all right let us see how that's going to work so on day 1 after recognizing the asset i will prepare something called as amortization table all right this amortization table is a word that is just coined by me don't go and use it anywhere else the first table i'm saying is the first heading let's say is year the second table let us the second heading let's say is opening balance third 
interest fourth repayments and last one is closing balance all right okay now in the year 31st march 2023 which is the first year all right in on in the year 31st march 2023 my opening balance is actually nothing but 1090 all right if you are able to see my opening balance because i've purchased it on that particular date on the 1st of april 2022 my opening balance is actually 1090 all right i will be recognizing interest at 4.71 percentage all right so this is my interest income the column e that i have over here is nothing but the interest income that i'm actually recognizing i will be recognizing the interest income on the amount Amount of my purchase price, all right. Although I'm going to receive coupon on face value, I am I'm disregarding that face value and disregarding the coupon that I'm receiving. And my interest income is solely based on my book value multiplied by the effective interest rate, all right. So I will be recognizing an interest of fifty one rupees for the first year. I after after i recognize this 51, my ledger balance. If you're able to imagine, I already had a balance of thousand ninety. I have Recognized an entry stating bond account debit to P and L account, bond account debit to interest account, right? So my bond account is technically having a balance of one one four one at this stage. All right, my bond account at this point is having one one four one. I have received a cash flow of eighty. Remember, the cash flows are not going to change based on the effective interest rate. The cash flows is obviously based on the face value and the coupon. The cash flow that I receive, I will no longer recognize that cash flow in my P and L account. But I will be recognizing that as a credit against my bond account. All right, it had a balance of one one four one. I am going to recognize a reduction in my asset of eighty rupees, and my closing balance is going to be opening balance plus interest minus any repayments. So my closing balance is thousand sixty one. This amortization table is nothing but a different version of your ledger account. What you used to prepare as a ledger account, this is nothing but a slightly different uh, view of the same ledger account. I had a beginning balance of thousand ninety because I purchased the bond on day one on first of April twenty twenty two. I recognized I accrued interest at fifty one rupees being. the opening balance the opening balance multiplied by the effective interest rate all right the opening balance multiplied by the effective rate interest rate gives me an interest of 51 rupees so the entry for this is bond account debit to interest income so 51 is recognized in my p and l as interest the the payment that i have received the 80 rupees that i have actually received which is the coupon receipt i will not recognize that in the pnl but i will reduce that against the uh, asset or financial asset which is the bond account and i have a closing balance of 1061 on the 31st of march 2024 which is the next year what was the beginning balance the beginning balance for this year is nothing but the closing balance of the last year all right so the beginning balance for the second year is the closing balance for the uh, for the previous year this year again i will recognize interest on the beginning book value multiplied by the effective interest rate all right the beginning book value multiplied by the effective interest rate and i will again recognize a repayment of 80 rupees against my asset account all right my asset had a carrying balance of One 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 one. I am recognizing a reduction in the asset of eighty dollars. This reduction in the asset is nothing but I am receiving amount. So it is bank account debit to asset account, and I will have a closing balance of thousand thirty one. All right. So I had four ones over here. Minus eighty is one zero three one. Next year, which is thirty first of March twenty twenty five. Why am I typing thirty one thirty all the time? Anyways. opening balance for the second for the last year will be the closing balance of the second year so i have got a beginning balance of 1031 this time again the interest is going to be the beginning book value multiplied by the effective interest rate the beginning book value multiplied by the effective interest rate which happens to be 49 all right it is just a coincidence that it is reducing by $1 $1 each time but it's not necessarily that it, the reduction will be uniform all right i have increased the decimal so if you actually notice the reduction from 51.37 to 50.02 is around 1.35 and the reduction over here is not exactly equal to 1.35 it's greater than 1.35 so the reduction is not equal always all right it's just a coincidence that the numbers have come uh, such a way in the last year i have received a payment of 1080 all right i have received a payment of 1080 and i will recognize that as a reduction from the asset before i apply the formula of closing balance over here 
on the 31st of March 2025, the bond balance should ideally be zero because the bond does not uh, is not outstanding anymore. All right. There was a bond when I purchased it had a term of three years. At the end of three years, the bond is redeemed and your asset account cannot have any balance. All right. So logically speaking, your asset account should have zero balance on the 31st of March 2025 because once a bond is redeemed, you cannot have any other balance. All right. I am applying the formula. And you're going to see that the balance has actually gone down to zero. Your bad, I mean, it's the last decimal is more a rounding off issue. So please ignore that. All right. The bond has gone down to zero. So what have we effectively done? I one point number one, I've calculated something called as the effective interest rate. All right. I, or before that, I recognize the financial asset at its fair value. And if there are any transaction costs, I'm supposed to be adding that transaction cost. All right. So the only difference will be once I add the transaction cost, this instead of 1090, it might become 1092. All right. And once it becomes 1092, my effective interest rate will further get reduced right because i my cash outflow has increased therefore my return will reduce slightly that is the only change otherwise i've ignored transaction costs for now after uh, step number two i will calculate the effective interest rate using excel function we can calculate as irr this is the same irr that you, you guys used to calculate in capital budgeting back in your school days or i mean back in your uh, student days IRR, the principle, it, I mean, by principle, it means this is the return on investment. You have invested 1090, you're receiving 80, 80 and 1080 on a per annum basis, your return is 4.71 percentage. Your question could be, if I am actually, uh, if the bond is paying a coupon of 8 percentage, why is my, why am I earning only a return of 4.71? The answer is I'm earning a lesser return because there is a capital loss that I'm actually incurring. I have paid 1090, whereas I'm I'm only getting 1000 rupees and therefore that 90 rupees capital loss when spread over a period of three years is eroding my capital is eroding my return and therefore my return has come down from eight percentage to 4.71 percentage i will say that this is my effective interest rate effectively this is the interest rate or this is the return that i'm earning by investing in this bond all right so although the cash flows are based on eight percentage and thousand face value i am going to recognize interest at 4.71 percentage only and then we build this amortization table. This amortization table is nothing but a different view of the ledger balance. All right. It's a different view of the ledger balance. You've got an opening balance. Your interest is based on the opening balance multiplied by the effective interest rate and all cash flows, whether the cash flow is coupon, whether the cash flow is pay a principal, you do not care. All the cash flows are going to be seen as a reduction from the asset account only. All right. It's going to be seen as a reduction from the asset account and your closing balance is eventually going down. Down to zero all right your closing balance is eventually going down to zero if you actually carefully look at it you had a beginning balance of 1090 slowly the balance is actually reducing from 1090 it came down to 1061 from 1061 it came down to 1031 what it was doing is it was spreading that excess 90 rupees that you actually paid that was slowly getting amortized in the pnl account how was it getting amortized in the pnl account by recognizing a lower interest income although you received 80 you recognized an interest income of only 51 50 and 48 so that effectively was nothing but the amortization of capital loss all right a few more points to discuss under this method, what is the total interest income that we are recognizing? The total interest income that we are recognizing is 150 rupees. All right. The total interest income that we are recognized in PNL account is 150 rupees. Now let us come out of all this complex accounting. Let us think normally. All right. You have received 80, 80 and 80 in three years as in the form of coupon you have received 80 80 and 80 in the in three years which totally amounts to 240 rupees you have had a capital loss of 90 rupees all right 240 rupees was your in, in coupon that the company was actually paying you 90 rupees is the capital loss so technically if you think of it logically as well the total amount of net gain that you had is 150 rupees. The 240 minus 90 is 150 rupees. And this amortized cost method or effective interest rate method is ensuring that you recognize that 150 in PNL account 
over a period of three years using the effective interest rate method. All right. So common sense wise, yes, you earned an income of 150 rupees. What does amortization or in accounting terms, what we are also doing is that we are recognizing 150 rupees in our PNL account over a period of three years using the effective interest rate method. All right. That is how we actually account for financial assets at amortized cost. All right. If let us say there is a transaction cost, it will just get built up and your effective interest rate will slightly change. All right. This effective interest rate was also referred to as the YTM of the bond. For those of you who are able to remember, this effective interest rate is also called as the yield to maturity for the bond, all right? Uh, uh, like under the strategic financial management or in the financial management world, this is also referred to as the YTM or yield to maturity, which means this is the return or the yield that you are earning if you hold the bond up to its maturity. That's just a, another name, but that term is not really recognized under IFRS 9, and therefore I'm not going to use that term as much. All right, let's take another quick example, more on the same lines, but this I'm more trying to take it in the form of a loan that is actually given. All right, let us say I am giving a loan to you. All right, I'm giving a loan to you of rupees 1 lakh. Sorry. Okay, I am giving a loan to you of 1, 1 lakh rupees. And for the legal documentation and all such uh, amount, uh, for the legal documentation, etc., let us say maybe we incurred an expense of 5,000 rupees. All right, let's say we incurred an expense of 5,000 rupees. So this is actually transaction cost. All right, this is actually transaction cost. Let's say the interest that I'm charging from you is 10%, and the tenure of the loan is say five years. All right, the tenure of the loan is five years. So 1 lakh is the amount that I've actually given you, but for the purpose of legal documentation, getting the agreements, getting that uh, some maybe, you know, something typed, etc. I incurred a 5,000 rupees transaction cost. I have an interest of 10 percentage, which means you will keep paying me interest of 10 percentage. And this 10 percentage obviously is going to be on the loan amount outstanding. And the tenure is, let's say five years. And I am presuming that principal is, let us say, paid and I'm just thinking if I should just say principal is paid in one shot or should we say principal is paid every year? Let us say I'm, pay, I'm assuming that principal is paid in one shot at the end of five years, all right? Because in the loan, you can also have principal being paid every year, right? But I'm assuming a bullet payment over here, which is being done at the end of five years, all right? Over here, step one is, it is whether it is a financial asset. It is going to be treated as a financial asset because this loan is giving me a contractual right to receive cash flows. All right. It's giving me a contractual right to receive cash. So it is a financial asset. Step number two is business model test one and CCFT test should get cleared. And over here, it is obviously getting cleared because the loan, I'm intending to hold it up to its maturity to collect the cash flows. And CCFT test is also cleared because the benefit is solely comprising of payments of principal and interest, all right? So both of them are passed. After that, step three is the initial recognition where I said that if the asset is measured at amortized cost, initial recognition is going to happen at the fair value plus any transaction costs that I've actually incurred, all right? Now, over here, I've not purchased the loan from a market, all right? Unlike the previous example, where I purchased the bond from the market, over here, I did not purchase the loan from the market, but I originated the loan, all right? And I, I made a statement earlier that we will always presume that the cash paid is equal to the fair value, all right? The cash paid is equal to the fair value. What we are going to actually see over here is we will actually evaluate whether the 10% that I am charging from you is actually an off market transaction or is it an appropriate amount of interest rate? All right. If this is an appropriate amount of interest rate, then I will say that 1 lakh is actually the fair value. All right. But if the general market interest rate is, let's say, 15 percentage, while I am charging 10 percent from you, then it is an off market transaction and the 1 lakh amount of cash paid will not be treated as fair value. 
what will we what will we do in such case is a second uh, will be covered as part of the next video but for this video i am saying that 10 percent is the general market interest rate and i am also charging 10 percent from you i'm just repeating myself if the general market interest rate was let's say 15 percentage and if i am charging 10 percent from you then i cannot say that the amount of cash paid to you of one lakh rupees is a fair value amount all right the fair value amount is going to be different because this is more like a transaction where i've given you an, uh, a concessional rate of interest all right so the amount of cash paid is not the fair value in this example to proceed with this example i am presuming that interest that i am charging from you is equal to the general market interest rate of 10 percentage all right All right. So now that it's the now that this interest that I'm charging is equal to the general market interest rate, the amount of loan I'm presuming, the amount of cash that I've paid out as loan, I'm presuming that to be equal to the fair value. All right. So on day one, my initial recognition will be at one lakh five thousand, which includes the transaction costs as well. All right. So I am going to recognize loan account debit of one lakh. Over and above that, I will also recognize the loan account with, I will also debit the loan account with regard to the transaction cost. And I have a cash outflow on day one to the tune of 1,5,000. I've paid you 1,0,000. I've given you 1,0,000 in the form of loan, while the other 5,000 expenses I probably incurred and paid to some other third party. But I will actually show the entire amount as loan to Mr. A, whoever you are, loan to Mr. A of 1,5,000 rupees. All right. So I will be recognizing loan at rupees 1,5,000 on day one. After that, step number four over here is that I'm supposed to calculate the effective interest rate, all right? Although my interest rate over here is 10 percentage, my effective interest rate will slightly be lower than 10 percentage because of the transaction costs that are actually incurred. In the above example, sorry, in the above example, my effective interest rate was lower than the coupon because of the capital loss that I was incurring. Whereas over here, it's going to be slightly lower because of the effective interest rate. Let us build that table. All right. Now the table will be for five years. All right. Let us say the loan was given on 1st April 2021. All right. So on 1st April 2021, I have got a cash outflow of 1,5,000 or out, this entire 1,5,000 has probably not been given to you. Only 1 lakh has been given to you and the remaining 5,000, I actually incurred it in the form of expenses, but still I'm going to show the cash outflow on day one as 1,5,000. 1 31st of March, 2022, I am going to receive uh, the interest income from you, which happens to be 10 percentage of 1 lakh which is 10,000 all right so I will be receiving 10,000 rupees as interest from you 31st of March 2023 again I will receive 10,000 so I'm going to receive 10,000 for a period of four years all right I'm going to receive 10,000 10,000 10,000 for a period of four years and in the last year which is 31st of March 2026 I am going to receive 1 lakh 10,000 one lakh being the original principal that I actually gave you, the additional 10,000 being the interest for the last year, all right? So for this for this loan, the typical cash flows are, I am paying out one lakh 5,000 on day one, I'm receiving 10,000, 10,000, 10,000, 10,000 for a period of four years. And in the last year, I'm receiving one lakh 10,000, which is principal repayment plus the interest for that period. I will again calculate the XIRR, where I'm giving the input as cash flows, and the corresponding dates, all right? And I have got an XIRR of 8 point or 8.72 percentage, all right? This is the effective interest rate. Effectively, I have earned an interest of, I'm earning an interest of 8.72 percentage on a per annum basis. Although this low, through this loan, I'm actually receiving 10 percentage in the form of coupon, this 5,000 transaction cost that I've incurred is being amortized over a period of five years. And that is driving a low effective interest rate for me again i can the the step number five will be making the amortization table and remember the amortization table is just a different view of the ledger balance itself or the ledger account itself so here i will then have opening balance i'll have interest 
where the interest is recognized at the effective interest rate method. All right, I am going to recognize interest income using the effective interest rate method. I will then have repayments, and I finally have the closing balance. All right, in the first year, first year being thirty first of March, twenty twenty two. What was my opening balance? My opening balance was one lakh five thousand. All right, because I gave the loan on the first day of this particular year, my opening balance typically becomes one lakh five thousand. I am going to recognize interest at the effective interest rate of eight point seven two percentage. So I am going to recognize it at opening book value multiplied by the effective interest rate, which is nine one six one. All right, this is the interest income that I will be showing in my P and L account. All right, so initially I've created. Posted an entry of loan account debit to bank account. Next, I am recognizing an entry of loan debit to interest income in the P and L of nine one six one. So my loan balance has got a total balance of one one four one sixty one one lakh fourteen thousand one sixty one is the total balance of the loan at this point in time. I received ten thousand in the first year on thirty first of March twenty twenty two. I received ten thousand, and my closing balance is going to be. One lakh five thousand plus nine one six one minus ten thousand, which happens to be one zero four one six one. All right. Similarly, thirty first of March, twenty twenty three, the opening balance for this year will become equal to the closing balance for the previous year. Interest, I'm recognizing it again using the effective interest rate, which is the beginning book value multiplied by the effective interest rate. All right. I had to receive. A, I have a loan financial asset of one lakh four thousand. So I will recognize interest on the one lakh four thousand at eight point seven two percentage, which happens to be nine thousand eighty eight. Again, I receive a repayment of ten thousand rupees in the on in the second year, and my closing balance happens to be one not three two forty nine. All right, one not four plus nine thousand minus ten thousand is equal to one lakh three thousand two hundred and forty nine. Thirty first of March twenty twenty four is again going to be the same story. I am going to carry forward my beginning balance. My effective interest rate is going to be at a eight point seven two percentage. My repayment will be ten thousand again, which is for the third year, and my closing balance is going to be one not two two hundred and fifty seven. I'm just dragging the formula for the remaining two years. Maybe let me just drag these two rows for now. Okay, thirty first of March twenty twenty six, which is the last year. After the last payment has been made, after I've received interest of ten thousand for the last year, and after I've received the principal for the last year, my closing balance has to be logically zero. All right. Uh, once the principal amount has been repaid, I cannot have any closing balance left over. Let us see whether this table is actually achieving that or not. All right. It is a it, there is a residual number of six rupees that is left. Obviously, that six rupees is a rounding one, and you will adjust it against your effective interest rate income or, or interest income. You instead of recognizing eight eight two eight, you will recognize eight eight two two, so that this balance actually goes down absolutely to zero. All right, this is how we are actually going to recognize this column is going to be shown as part of your interest income. The closing balance is what we are actually showing in our balance sheet. All right, in our balance sheet, this is the closing balance that we are actually showing. Even in the first example, I was not bothered about what is the fair value of the Reliance bond at the end of each year. I did not even give you that information. I ignored the fair value fluctuations because my intent is to hold it up to maturity. If my intent is to hold it up to maturity, I am not bothered about any fair value fluctuations that happen in between, and therefore we are. Actually, we did not even consider the fair value. And obviously, the second case, because it was a loan transaction, you obviously do not have the fair value that is openly available in the market. But even if it was available, you would not be bothered about it, and you will be only bothered about the closing balance as per this amortization table. All right. So this is the interest income that you are recognizing, and this is the closing balance that you will have on your balance sheet at the end of each year your repayments are going to be even though you are getting payment in the form of in the name of coupon you are not going to recognize that in the p and l account but you will be recognizing that as a reduction from the asset you will be recognizing that as a reduction from the asset
over a period of five years, if you look at it, over a period of five years, you have recognized interest income of 45,000 rupees, all right? In year one, 9,000, year two, 9,000, 9,000, 8,900, 8,800. Effectively, you, are recog you have recognized an interest income of 45,000 rupees. Now, come out of accounts. Just think logically. You have actually received 10,000 for a period of five years. You have received 10,000 for a period of five years. So that becomes 50,000. And you incurred a transaction cost of 5,000. All right. You incurred a transaction cost of 5,000. So effectively, your net income was actually 45,000. And using this amortization table also, you recognize an interest income of 45,000. That last digit six is actually the six that is getting left over over here. If you adjust it, it will be exactly 45,000 rupees. All right. So what effective interest or uh, rate method or amortized cost method ensures is that you recognize interest income i mean whatever is your actual net income in real world that is also recognized as interest income in accounting but just it's not used using the coupon rate which is mentioned but you are calculating something called as the effective interest rate or the irr in using that you're recognizing interest income or interest expense all right a few uh, a few last points before we end this video I may have a case where I'm purchasing a bond at a discount, all right? There may be cases where I'm actually purchasing bond at a discount. If I purchase a bond at a discount, my effective interest rate will be greater than 8% because in that case, I have a capital gain, all right? Let us say if I purchase it for 950 over and above the 8% that the company is paying me, I have a capital gain of uh, 50 rupees, which when translated on a per annum basis may actually push my IRR upwards and it will be greater than 8 percentage. Maybe it will be about 8.5 percentage or so on. Your table will continue to be in the same fashion. Your table will exactly be in the same way. Just that over here, your opening balance will be 950 and your interest income in that case will actually be on the higher side. Your interest income will actually be greater than the 80 rupees because your 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 interest rate is at let's say 8.5 percentage so the amount of interest that you will be recognizing is going to be more than the 80 rupees that you're actually receiving in the form of coupon so that is point number one point number two is if you purchase it at equal to face value all right let us say if you purchase it at equal to face value and if you do not have any transaction costs all right so in this case let us say if you did not have any transaction costs or in the previous example where you purchase it at fair face value then you do not have to calculate effective interest rate because your irr and interest income are going to be exactly the same all right your irr and effective interest rate are i mean your irr and interest or rate or coupon rate is not the same over here because you have some transaction element or you have some premium or discount all right if your face if your purchase price and if your uh, i mean if you do not have any uh, transaction cost or if your purchase price is equal to the face value then you are actually not required to calculate any effective interest rate because in that case your interest income and effective interest i mean your, your coupon rate and the effective interest rate will actually be exactly the same all right you are you will be recognizing interest also at 10000 all right in this case if there was no transaction cost your interest income every year will be recognized at 10000 only and your repayment will also be equal to 10000 and your closing balance right from year 1 it will be 1 lakh 1 lakh 1 lakh and when you receive the last payment the 1 lakh will become zero and one shot all right that is point number 2 point number 3 that i actually wanted to say is not necessarily your payment of principal is not necessarily going to be done at the end of fifth year. You, you might have pay repayments of principal, let's say on an every year basis. If your principal is getting paid every year, then your amount of interest that you calculate will also undergo a change. All right. Obviously, when your principal balance is actually reducing, then you're not going, let's say in the first year, I'm repaid 20,000. All right. If, if in the first year, I'm repaid 20,000 of principal, then I'm going to have an outstanding principal of only 80,000. And for the next year, the coupon will only be 8,000. 80,000 multiplied by 10 percentage, it will be only 8,000 rupees. So your cash flows 
are a function of whether the principal, your cash flows of interest are a function of whether the principal is being paid in one shot or whether the principal is actually being paid in uh, equal installments or in any other format over a period of five or whatever the tenor of the loan is. All right. So obviously, the, I mean, over here, the cash flow construction was fairly easier. But if you, if you imagine if there is a repayment of principal every year, then you actually have to calculate what is the interest income that you, what is the interest that you're going to receive receive every year from the other party and then you will finally calculate the cash flows along with the principal payments in each year and your cash flows in that case will be both principal plus the interest amount all right i hope you've got you have understood in the next session we'll actually see how do we account for off market uh, transaction all right let us say the general market interest rate is 15 percentage but you have given a loan at 10 percentage how do we account for it all right because in that case this one lakh that i've given out as in the form of cash cannot be considered as a uh, fair value and therefore we'll have to do some tweaks to actually understand how it is accounted for that's it for this session thank you guys